Yeah. I have that problem too. Well, good morning. You guys are in luck today. You get this whole service just for you. Super intimate. Um, just one thing I want to mention before we get started. You guys have the survey. You guys got it online. Chuck Stacy said he's received five of them. Um, that survey is something our, uh, we have a, a long range planning committee has spent a long time developing, probably the better part of a year. Um, it's to help us develop a five-year plan for the church, and so your thoughts and opinions really, 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 really matter, um, especially as we start to look at some creative ways to do different things here at Bethania. So um, we'll even accept answers from you, Chuck. <laughs> um, so the survey is going to be open until the end of September. Please fill it out if you can. I know it's really long. Most long-range um, plans usually have a space for about three or four different surveys. We decided to combine it all into one and just get, it, get the painful part over with. Um, so I'm going to be harping on everybody to try to get these done um, by the end of the month, and uh, then we can kind of check out the data and move forward. So thank you for starting that. Um, Chuck, make sure you do it. All right. <laughs> And then finally, let's just go over the psalm real quick. That's on page four, um, just the, the refrain here. I know there's only a few of us, so I'm not going to put a lot of pressure on you guys to sing loudly. Um, I think today we're going to go with sing however it's comfortable to you. They are like trees. Welcome to worship. Let us take a moment to prepare our hearts and minds.
please be seated. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Let us pray. Jealous God, you call us to hate the life that is an echo of death and a whisper of fear. Give us the courage to pass through shadows and count the cost of love beyond measure through Jesus Christ, the one who is fully alive. Amen. Okay. <laughs> All right, and I'm going to come down to you guys. I'm not going to make you come sit on the stairs, okay? Hi, Marjorie. <clears throat> I was sitting up there singing, and she was here coloring like this, and she would just look at me like this with a big smile on her face, and then she would go back to coloring, and then she would do it again. And it was like both so creepy and so cute at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how many of you guys like cake? I love cake. You love cake? Do you, have, do you have cake? All right, so we like cake. Henley, do you like cake? No. Oh, come on. Okay, how about, um, how about candy? Maybe chocolate? No? <laughs> Elliot, do you like chocolate? Yeah? Griffin, what about you? Do you love chocolate? Sort of. Love-hate relationship. Alana, do you love chocolate? Candy? What about potato chips? Oh, yeah? Yeah, what about you, Elliot? Potato chips? Henley, do you like potato chips? Henley, do you like food? Yeah? What's your favorite food? 
There it is, ice cream. Do you guys like ice cream? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> Bribery, I love it. I am not against that at all. Yep, ice cream. Marjorie, do you like ice cream? Jur Jury's out, she does, yeah? You know what's crazy about like ice cream and chocolate and candy and cake and potato chips? They taste like super good, but if you eat too much of it, it's not good for you, right? I know, we've all heard that, it kind of ruins it. Like, Pastor Chris, you're being the parent here. We've got enough of that in our life already. <laughs> we don't need that reminder. You know, faith is kind of like the same, in the sense that faith, like believing in God or Jesus or Buddha or what uh, the Quran says or what a lot of the writings that the Hindus believe in says, a lot of faiths all talk about things that don't really taste so good right away like candy and cake and chocolate and potato chips and ice cream. Things that uh, you kind of have to put some work into. Um, how many of you like vegetables? You like vegetables? Do you like vegetables? Do you like broccoli? Nope, there it is. Elliot, do you know what the difference is between broccoli and boogers? Kids don't eat broccoli. Faith is kind of like vegetables almost too, like it takes a while to grow to like it. And it's also really good for you. And so what our faith tells us is that we're called to love other people and we're called to devote our time and our energy and our resources to helping other people. And that doesn't feel so good right away like when you eat candy and ice cream. But over time you really start to enjoy it and you find out it's like one of the best things for you to just love other people. It's a terrible analogy trying to compare faith to vegetables and hope that you come back to church. But I did it anyways, okay? So I, pr I promise you, Elliot, one day broccoli will maybe taste good. Maybe. But it's super good for you. And loving other people is going to be one of the best things that makes you happy in life. All right? All right, good job. <laughs> Reading from Deuteronomy. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if you turn your hearts away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land of the Lord, swore to give your descendants, to Ab Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on God's teaching day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water. They are like 
like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall be destroyed. They are like trees planted by streams, A reading from the letter from Paul to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank God because I hear of you, of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because of the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, Yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of the love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, who was, whose father I have become through my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever no longer as a slave, but much more than a slave, a, bro a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge, it, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay. I say nothing about your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident in your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost, to see whether he has enough to complete it? 
Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider, consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, dear siblings, grace and peace to you from God in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. That was fun when I held up that gospel book right now and I said, um, the gospel of the Lord, and you all kind of went, thanks be to God? Like, do I want to agree with what I just heard him read? <laughs> yes, Kaden. That's like the most profound thing I've ever heard, Caden, sincerely. <laughs> right? Chuck's impressed too. <laughs> um, and I want to build on that kind of awkwardness of that story. So, you know, imagine for a second you, um, you come to this church for the very first time to check it out. The people are super friendly. Uh, the pastor's this really good looking guy that gives really incredible sermons all the time. And, um, you know, you go for a few weeks and you really like it. And so, you call up the pastor and say, hey, can I come in and talk to you? And uh, you come in and you say, you know, I've really, really enjoyed being here with your church and I think I'm ready to become a member. What do I have to do to become a member of your church? And the pastor says, oh, just a few things real quick. So if you want to become a member of our church, number one, uh, you have to hate your mother and your father. And the person says, wait, say that again? You say, yeah, no, no, yeah, you heard me right. You have to hate your mother and your father. Oh, and, and also you have to hate your spouse and your kids. You have to do that too if you want to become a member of our church. Oh, and you have to hate your siblings also. That one might not be too hard. Oh, and then, and then one more thing. You also have to hate your life. So just four really, really short things right there. Just a very small list. Four things right there. You want to join our church. Just do those things. Here's the paperwork. Sign when you're ready. I don't imagine many people would join that church. Um, it, it almost sounds like a cult, if you ask me. But how do you reconcile that with Jesus' words today? I mean, Jesus literally says in that story, if you want to become my disciple, you must hate your mother and your father and your spouse and your kids and your siblings and even your own life. How do you reconcile? that. Well, good news. I don't think Jesus is literally asking us to do those things, right? Thank God. Um, but I think Jesus is doing something brilliant here as an orator. And this is, a, this is the problem that a lot of people have with Jesus, is people always take Jesus literally and don't realize that 2,000 years ago, hyperbole and allegory and metaphors was one of the best way of communicating truths to people. And Jesus does that frequently. And I think Jesus is using this really wonderful tactic to look at all of these people who are flocking to him, who want to be his followers, who, who are saying, Jesus, let us follow you. And he's saying, okay, you want to follow me? This is what you have to do. I think Jesus is intentionally giving people an impossible task to highlight the truth that we as people cannot follow Jesus. We are unable to follow the Jesus way, the way of complete self-sacrifice, of devotion to the world, the way of looking at the powers and principalities of that time and saying no to say that God's way is for the weak and the powerless in this world, to do all of that perfectly all the time, I think Jesus is telling people, you cannot 
do this. And I think the point of this story is for us to realize that. I think it's for that truth to reach right down into our hearts, to the pits of our souls, to say if we want to call ourselves Christians, if we want to say that we are followers of Jesus, if we want to be people that go to church every Sunday and feel good about ourselves because we do it, we need to hear this truth that we can't. That you cannot be a follower of Jesus. It is impossible. To feel that truth and then to realize that Jesus still calls you to follow him. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, have any of you heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? A couple people. Chuck, I know you have. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in Germany. He was a Lutheran pastor right as Hitler and the Nazi party was coming to power. And um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer came from a very wealthy professional family. Uh, His parents wanted him to be a doctor or a lawyer or one of those higher professions. And when he said that he wanted to be a pastor, at first they were kind of disappointed, but then they ended up fully supporting him. And when Hitler started gaining popularity, especially when he was uh, elected chancellor of Germany, uh, one of the first things Hitler did was reach out to the churches in Germany. And the churches all looked at Hitler and knew that this was not a good guy, but Hitler promised them the world. And so they aligned with him. The German churches uh, was one of the first areas of life that Hitler was able to get under his umbrella before moving into what the Nazis did. And when Hitler started doing that, when the German churches started aligning with Hitler, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of the very first people to say, no, this is wrong. This is a sacrifice of everything that is fundamental to who we are as Christians. And as the Nazis gained power and as the German churches continued to side with Hitler, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer started what was known as the confessional churches in this time. And these were churches that Uh, We're going to hold true to their confession as Christians to be there for the weak and the powerless and the marginalized and the oppressed. Essentially, the Jewish people, uh, Roma people, all of the minorities that were persecuted by Nazis in this time. Um, And Dietrich Bonhoeffer did this from this profound place of understanding his call as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. He knew the cost to be a disciple, and he was completely willing to pay it to the extent that he was even involved in the plot to assassinate Hitler, and he was arrested for it and eventually killed in a concentration camp. Not only was Dietrich Bonhoeffer so willing to pay this price for his understanding of this call as a Christian, he was probably the most significant theologian in modern history. My favorite theologian, But if he would have survived Nazi Germany, I think Bonhoeffer would have changed the the church forever. When he was in prison, he wrote letters back and forth to his family members, to his wife, to his best friend. Um, And his best friend was an editor. And after after Bonhoeffer died, he collected all of those letters and he published them into a book, which is this book here, Letters and Papers from Prison. Um, If you ever want to read this book, Talk to me first because these are all letters and only 30 of them are about theology. So unless you want to hear him talk to his parents about like the weather, don't just buy this book and start reading it. Come and talk to me first. I have a list of where all the theological parts are. But I'll tell you as a pastor, as a theologian, as a person of profound faith who has a lot of um, hope for what the church could be, I don't find resonance to that more powerfully than I do in this book, than the words that Bonhoeffer wrote in here. One of the things he talks about in here is religionless Christianity. Let's say that again. Religionless Christianity. That was a phrase that Bonhoeffer coined. And it was his hope that churches that Christians, that that followers of Jesus would become religionless. 
right, Marjorie? Like, how can that be? How can a church be religionless? How can a follower of Jesus, how can a person of faith be religionless? And for Bonhoeffer, what he saw was that churches in Germany had offered their people a solution to God's salvation. This is very medieval stuff, but in 1940s Germany, what the churches had done was say, hey, if you do these things right here, then you don't have to worry about these gross atrocities that are happening over here. You can still call yourself a Christian and a follower of Christ. And that is exactly what the German churches did, and it's what enabled Hitler to come to power. And Bonhoeffer saw that and thought to himself, churches have lost their religion. Churches no longer serve a purpose. They cannot function anymore as a medium for people to be followers of Christ. And so Bonhoeffer hoped for a religionless Christianity. And I want to share just some words that he wrote about this. Does the question about saving one's soul even appear in the Old Testament at all? Aren't righteousness in the kingdom of God on earth the focus of everything? And isn't it true that Romans 3.24 is not an individualistic doctrine of salvation, but the culmination of the view that God alone is righteous? It is not with the beyond... (laughs) It is not with the beyond that we are concerned, but with this world as created and preserved subjected to laws, reconciled, and restored. What is above this world is, in the gospel, intended to exist for this world. I mean that not in an anthropocentric sense of liberal, mystic, pietistic, ethical theology. Neglect that phrase, that's too hard to chew. But in the biblical sense of the creation and of the incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I look at a lot of the functions of the church today in our society, I see a church that has adapted to the consumeristic models of this world. A church that is more focused with an individual's relationship with God and an individual feeling good about themselves and not so concerned with the levels of suffering and poverty and things that we as Christians are called to be focused on. I read these words that are 80 years old and think that they profoundly describe our understanding of faith today. And I think that's why Jesus says these words at times, where he tells people that if you want to be my follower, you must hate your family. You must hate your life. You must sell all of your possessions. I think Jesus encounters us in a space where we look at faith as though it's simply another self-help thing meant to make us feel good, meant to make us feel right, meant to make us feel that we are able to control even our own happiness. And that's not who Jesus is about. And that's not what the Jesus way is about. I think Jesus gives us this impossible task of following him, this this task that we could never, ever hope to accomplish as a way to help us let go of our own egos, as a way to look at what it means to follow the Jesus way and say, this isn't about our own salvation. This isn't about us individually being right with God. This isn't about us adopting a faith where we can come and feel good one hour a week and ignore all of the things that happen in this world that we as followers of Jesus are called to focus on. When I think about uh, this church, when I think about what we are called to be as Christians, I'm going to be honest with you. 
um, believing that Jesus is the Son of God is not very high on my list. In fact, when you read the Gospels, nowhere in it does it ever uh, have Jesus say to worship me. Did you know that? Not once does Jesus ever say to worship me. But dozens of times, Jesus does say to follow me. I think Jesus is far more concerned about us not moving into a faith that allows us to simply feel good about ourselves, but rather a faith that allows us to move outward from ourselves to embrace God and each other in this incredibly beautiful world we have and in the faces of all those who suffer that we are called to see God in. When I think of the mission of this church, I think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's words when he says it is not with the beyond that we are concerned, but with the world as created and preserved, a world that is literally on fire right now, a world that is in desperate need of human beings to see God in and to rescue, a world subjected to laws not so much by governments by a God who asks us to speak up against injustice in a world that is reconciled and restored. So I'll tell you folks, we don't care about reconciliation and restoration. Uh, what our society cares about is profitability. And my hope for this church here My hope for us as this church here is not a church that is so consumed with what we believe as much as we are a church that is consumed with how we live. And so I want to close with these words from Bonhoeffer. The church is the church only when it exists for others. Not dominating, but helping and serving. It must tell people of every calling what it means to live for Christ which is this, to exist for others. Amen.
Please rise so that we may confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join our hearts in prayer as we pray for the church, the earth, and all of God's creation. Lord God, we thank and praise you that you call us to the impossible so that we may recognize your hand at work in us, so that we may give you glory as we go out and help others in your name. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, perhaps there is no better prayer than the one we just sang in the hymn. Help us to recognize all of the walls that divide us, all of the neighbor's good, those that hurt, those who are hurted. Help us to forgive, to renew. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for those among us, Glenn Jacobson, Bob Peterson, and Myra Peterson, for those who serve our country both at home and abroad, as well as those we name in our hearts and those we name out loud. Marty Jones. We commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your grace, your mercy, and most especially in your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please join me in sharing an expression of peace.
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. of his arrest, our Lord Jesus was celebrating the Passover feast. During that meal, he took a loaf of bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to those gathered with him, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took a cup of wine, and again he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is a new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Every time you drink wine, remember me. We remember Jesus in the bread, the wine, the prayer that he taught us. If you'll pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My hope is that when you come forward to receive this bread and wine, that you come forward to let go of your egos, to realize that this is God's love for you no matter what. You haven't earned it. It's just simply there. That we are called through this to let go of our egos and to simply love others.
May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace always. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.